the German philosopher Habermas, in a book published three or four years ago, reflected on what he calls the end of philosophy, the end of ideas, musing on the following curious reality. In uh, all earlier generations, when human beings sought to make sense of themselves and the world, the one thing that was constant was the human self. Ideas about God, or the gods, could and do to change. Ideas about the meaning of the world, our life after death, uh, the list of virtues and vices, all of this was negotiated and the subject of famous dispute down the generations of Bani Adam, but the one thing everybody agreed on was that the one that observed this was essentially the same. Human beings were the same kind of thing. Habermas then goes on to reflect that ours is the generation in which that is no longer necessarily the case. Ours is the generation in which we can edit ourselves so profoundly that uh, all earlier forms of religious or secular reflection are being interrogated in a way that may prove catastrophic. And here he says, essentially, transhumanism is going to put an end to all traditional shapes of belief. Because whereas previously we always assumed that the consciousness that inhabited human brains was the same kind of thing, and that human beings, irrespective of differences of race and probably of gender as well, could communicate with each other, could exchange ideas about the good life and about meaning and about truth and about the absolute. Increasingly, human beings are not going to be able to do that. Why? Because of our capacity to edit ourselves. Not only do we understand our genetic foundation, but we are increasingly capable of mastery over it. Legislation at present restricts many of the applications of the new genetic science, but anybody who has worked in a modern university will be aware of the fact that the big questions have essentially been addressed and have been answered. Transhumanism is controversial, but it's always in the headlines. It's the big issue of the day. To what extent are we morally entitled, or even obliged, not only to find cures for diseases, but to ensure that those diseases never happen again? To what extent is it legitimate for us as human beings that grow sick and grow old and die to try and edit those fundamental aspects of the human condition out of the uh, infrastructure which sustains the species? We can identify the aging gene does that mean that we should eliminate it in newborn children so that everybody can live to be a thousand, unless, of course, they die in an air crash or some other uh, natural disaster? What are the implications of uh, discoveries about the function of human memory? If we can identify the genetic basis for forgetfulness, should we eliminate that? Should everybody have a, a photographic memory? What is the basis for our identification of genes for aggressive behavior, for antisocial behavior, for criminal behavior? And increasingly, in a strikingly deterministic way, the modern neuroscientists are saying human malfunction is the consequence of uh, an unfortunate genetic shuffle at the moment of conception. This is the way in which our moral life is being reduced to matters of DNA and chromosomes. All of these are troubling issues. Troubling in two ways. Firstly, because if Habermas is right and the human species within a generation or two will no longer exist to be replaced by something that we design to be very different and very much better. Um, but also because from the religious point of view, there is a certain rootedness between body and spirit that is going to be forever sundered. Only recently, a geneticist who's a Muslim came to me and said, the Pentagon wants him to do research into splicing human genes with the genetic material of fish to see if they can produce soldiers who can breathe underwater. It's illegal to actually do this, but they want the theoretical work done so that if the laws change as a result of the endlessly shifting public consensus on these issues, they'll be the first to do it. And his question was the practical one. 
in terms of the fit, assuming you have a sentient life form, a soldier or a sailor, who can live and breathe uh, underwater, what are the implications in terms of fiqh? How will such a person do their wudu? How will such a person fast during Ramadan? What is the hajj for such a person? And I had to admit that I didn't have anything even beginning uh, to resemble an answer to that person. So increasingly, as educated Muslims who read the headlines and are aware of what's happening in the world, we see that the large issue of today's world is not an alleged clash of civilizations or Islam and the West. Those are sideshows. The real issue is traditional humanity face to face with our completely unprecedented ability to edit our species so that something else emerges. This, everybody agrees, is going to be the big issue of the next 20 to 50 years. I begin with this because we know that in our case, the Sharia of Islam and the Sunnah of the Chosen One, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, are about our rootedness in our bodies and in the natural world. It's probably the case that in the controversies that we're going to be asked to offer opinions on over the next 20 or 30 years, um, Muslims are going to have more issues to deal with than followers of some other religions, than followers of body-denying religions, such as most forms of historic Christianity, and most forms of historic Buddhism, where the body, our physical form, is a kind of prison, something that we have to leave behind anyway. However, in the context of a religion such as Islam, where our rootedness in the ground of being comes through the body, where the body is not something that we slough off in order to release the spirit, as though it were nothing more than a cage from which our true selves have to emerge, there are going to be some very serious issues. And intelligent Muslims, instead of looking at the political headlines every day, over which we can do nothing and on which our opinions count for very little, are going to be thinking about these deeper issues, which are not presented by Islam or Islamic extremism or moderate Muslims or Islam of any kind, but are part of the inherent <coughs> extremism of the modern world. An extremism far more drastic than that dreamt up by any earlier generation. An extremism so absolute that it can propose consensually abolishing our species to replace it with something that we decide will probably be better. So as we ponder this, this reality, we have to think about the meaning of the sunnah. If you look at the landscape of the different world religions, you'll find that they evince a different range of opinions on the authoritative pattern laid down by the founder of that religion. But uh, it's a sound generalization to say, and I think we can say this without anybody um, um, contradicting us, that in the case of Islam, the emulation of the founder is far more critical to the project of salvation, of spiritual liberation, than it is in any other religion. Christians may propose what they call the imitatio Christi, be like Jesus, what would Jesus do? Jews might follow the way of the Torah, which was carried by its original prophet, Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam. Buddhists may wish to model themselves after the Eightfold Path, which they believe was mapped out by the historic Buddha. And his life of renunciation is, in a sense, a precedent which they follow. But the details that we find in the Sunnah, in Islam, do not have a parallel in any other major world religion. The question is that the fuqaha are going to be bewildered as they face the new reality of uh, genetically engineered humanity. And the preponderance of philosophical thinking now is that probably this is going to take place because if you can do away with cancer, you can do away with all of those ailments, you can make people see better, you can um, prevent them from ever forgetting anything. Inevitably, these things are going to become the realities that parents choose for their children. As the Pukaha deal with this, we are going to find um, that some of them kind of go along with it, uttering the usual nonsense about Islam as the modern religion, the religion of science, the religion of progress, and all of this other nonsense that we've never heard before in our history, but that so many of them desperately reach for. Uh, but we will also find a consensus and a majority, I think, who just say no 
we are not entitled to invalidate the books of fiqh. We can't change ourselves so that wudu and ghusl and ramadan and those things no longer have the effect on the soul that they are supposed to have. We can't abolish the five pillars through science. That, I suspect, is, given the, the blessed conservatism of our deepest instincts, what is going to happen. And that will be a big crisis because it will mean, I suspect, in about 50 years that humanity will be bifurcated even more than it is now. Just as it is, as it is now bifurcated, essentially, into the 75% who are either the consequences of progress or are on the road to progress and whose perception of the world is essentially an enlightenment secularized one and for whom God happens once a week and the 25% who essentially are protesting against that and saying no hold the phone we don't believe in this uh, we think that the sacred to be itself has to be part of every dimension of life the public as well as the private that split that we're already seeing which is the big split in today's world is going to manifest itself in the way people are physically with increasingly genetically engineered transhumans looking with amazement and Islamophobic contempt upon the Muslim Ummah, where I suspect the majority of people will not engineer their children in order to um, produce a generation of superhumans and thereby abolish most of the, the abwab or the chapters of, of, of the fiqh and the sharia. I suspect that's what's going to happen. What we're seeing now is just the preliminary to a much, much greater clash or divide. Sometimes we think, why are we always in the headlines? Why is it always us? Is this latest news item going to be about us again? But if you think about it, that is inevitable. Because uh, if the way of Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, is the last ship of salvation, the last bus home, there's not going to be another big religious dispensation on its way then necessarily it has within itself an inoculation that makes it very resistant to the virus of uh, secularity. It's no con coincidence that the last religion in history is also the one that modernity is struggling with the most. That's not an accident, that's how it has to be. Because we have in our um, inner metabolism uh, a form of life and an approach to the unseen which is divinely sculpted and designed to enable us to retain a connection with the sacred in our profane time. 